guys, it's Melissa Moore. Thank you so much for joining me for the latest episode of Faith, Hope, Love, where we grow together in our faith, increase in hope, and learn how to better love God and love other people. So I'm really excited for today's episode. I'm also a little nervous because it's a kind of more difficult, somewhat controversial topic. It's something that people kind of avoid this issue and just kind of deal with it on their own in private. And unfortunately, that doesn't always help the problem. And so I will be having a really wonderful guest on the show today, my good friend, Rosie McKinney. And she has her book out called Fight for Love. And it is uh, focusing on the issue of pornography. And that's a really hard word, (laughs) porn, um, to share in a Christian environment. But it's something we need to talk about. And so this episode today, we're going to be talking about two different passages, one in Matthew and one in John, and just learning about what Jesus says about adultery, which if you look at it, the way that Jesus comes at it, pornography is just modern day adultery. And so for us as Christians, or maybe if you're kind of interested in this, you're not, you haven't made a commitment to following Jesus yet. This is something that is pervasive in our society today. And so again, it's a hard topic, something that has impacted my life personally. We'll get to that in just a minute. I'll share a little bit of my story. But first, I just want to study what Jesus says about this issue. Um, I'll share a little bit about myself. And then we're going to bring on my good friend, Rosie McKinney, to really, really get a good look at the issue of pornography. So stick with me. I know it's a hard topic, but um, please I would love to engage with you if this is something that has impacted your life. Please um, shoot me a private message and I would love to dialogue with you about it. So uh, let's jump on in. All right, so I've kind of talked with you guys about it before. In general with this series, we're going as chronologically as possible. And so I wanna kind of talk about two different instances um, in Jesus' life and teaching. So he talks in Matthew 5 about this issue of adultery. And then later on, In John 8, um, which is a little bit later than this this instance, he encounters a woman caught in adultery. And so they're kind of two contrasting stories in the way that Jesus approaches and and deals with the issue. And I think it's important to look at both because there is this truth aspect of the issue of adultery or um, in modern day pornography or adultery, I guess that that does still happen today, Um, as well as the love and the compassion aspect of the issue. So again, we're starting in Matthew 5. So let's take a look at what Jesus has to say. So Jesus says, you have heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. But I tell you that anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your right eye causes you to stumble, gouge it out and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to stumble, cut it off and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to go into hell. Guys, that is heavy, heavy. I know that that's not an easy thing to hear, but that's how seriously Jesus looks at this issue. Again, it's not just a physical act of having sex with another person outside of um, your marriage relationship. Even looking at someone with that uh, that thought in your heart is not healthy either. Jesus talks about that essentially being equal. Our, our society doesn't view it that way right now. Um, it hasn't for a long time. And so with you know what Jesus is saying is, guys, it's even better for you to have only one eye or to have only one hand for you to be physically maimed than to be doing this. That's how seriously he's taking this issue. But there's also a contrast in John chapter eight. We see this situation where Jesus shows so much love and grace, this truth in love. At dawn, Jesus appeared again in the temple courts where all the people gathered around him and he sat down to teach them. The teachers of the law and the Pharisees brought in a woman caught in adultery. They made her stand before the group and said to Jesus, Teacher, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. In the law, Moses commanded us to stone such women. Now what do you say? They were using this question as a trap in order to have a basis for accusing him. But Jesus bent down and started to write on the ground with his finger. 
When they kept on questioning him, he straightened up and said to them, let any one of you who is without sin be the first to throw a stone at her. Again, he stooped down and wrote on the ground. At this, those who heard began to go away one at a time, the older ones first, until only Jesus was left with the woman still standing there. Jesus straightened up and asked her, woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? No one, sir, she said. Then neither do I condemn you, Jesus declared. Now go and leave your life of sin. This is such a profound passage because at this time, it would have been very normal if someone were caught having sex with someone outside of a marriage relationship. They would have been hit with large stones until they died. That was a very normal practice. But Jesus... He comes to her and he says, I don't condemn you. Now, it's a very interesting thing. If you look at the passage in general, a couple things. The, the Pharisees and the, the religious leaders, they only bring a woman. Where's the other party? Who else was involved in this? Why wasn't he present? I don't know. Also, what is Jesus doing? He's writing on the ground. Some people say maybe he's just doodling Maybe he's writing out the sins of the men that have brought this woman. We don't know. We don't know what Jesus was doing. We are just seeing that Jesus is essentially ignoring them because he knows as well as they know that they have also sinned. That they cannot condemn her because they too have sinned. And he looks at this woman who, again, would have been uh, socially outcast because of this behavior. And he looks at her with care and compassion and love. And he says to her, I do not condemn you. Now go and leave your life of sin. And that's a very interesting and important thing for us to notice. Because he doesn't just say, now go and do what makes you happy. Now go do what makes you feel good. He doesn't do that. He does choose to not condemn her. He responds to her in love, but he also speaks truth. Go and leave your life of sin, right? He acknowledges the stuff that she's doing is not good. Just like he told his disciples, committing adultery, whether physically or in your mind, is not good. Now go and leave your life of sin. He treats her with love and compassion, but he also calls her to live in a way that not just honors God, but is the best choice and the best, most healthy option for her. Now, as, as modern day believers, or maybe you're just watching this, kind of curious about what Jesus stands for, what he, what he talks about on this topic. Our culture is totally wide open. Anything is fair game. If it makes you feel good, do it. But Jesus says that's not the best thing for us. It's not what God wants for us. If that's something, adultery or pornography is something that hits you on a personal level, maybe you're walking through it, you're, you're engaging in, um, in adultery or in watching pornography. Maybe someone you love, maybe your spouse is walking through that right now. I want you to know two things. God doesn't want that for you. He wants you to live and walk in health and freedom. But also, he loves you and has so much compassion for you. And he's not going to condemn you or force you to walk through that alone. He wants to give you freedom. Now, this is a little scary for me personally uh, to share about the impact that this issue has had on my life. Um, I'm, I'm thankful it's not something that my husband has it, uh, have struggled with. It's not something that we have dealt with on his end in our marriage. But this is something to be you know, blatantly honest. Pornography is something that I have struggled with as a woman. And a lot of people will be like, what? How can that be? To be completely honest, that's an issue that a lot of women face, whether they're Christians or not. It's just the reality of our world today. And the problem, what's so difficult about this issue 
you don't have to go search for pornography online. For me, my issue was never with hardcore porn. That was never something that I struggled with. But stuff on like Netflix and Amazon Prime, honestly, is, is soft porn. Or some of it is really is hardcore porn. It's really easy to find these days. And that I think is why so many young people, so many people that are either Christians or not, that's why so many people are struggling with it because it's so easy to watch. It's so easy to stumble across it on accident even. It's scary to open yourself up with this kind of vulnerability and to, to really show like your biggest flaws. I've, I have carried a lot of shame around this issue for many, many years, something I struggled with um, through college as well as um, into my early marriage. And the reason behind that is because it's so easy to find this content now. But the reason that I share this is because it's possible to find freedom from it. I know for me, I've, I've gone to therapy. I've done a lot of work to work through this issue. And it's been a long time since I have watched anything of this, this variety. And for me, that's meant I watch a lot of cooking shows, you guys, because I can't handle even watching The Bachelor. I can't handle stuff like that because that's triggering for me. And I know that that's the same for a lot of people, that when you walk through this issue and you desire that you desire to find freedom from this, it's going to take a lot of change. You're going to have to remove the stuff from your watch list that maybe isn't, isn't bad, but it might trigger you and get you into that mindset. The difficult thing about pornography is once you watch it, it's, it's stuck in there. And it takes years and years to rewire your brain so that that stuff no longer impacts you. And so I want to encourage you, if you're walking through this today, either personally, if you're dealing with an addiction to pornography, if you're um, maybe watching a spouse going through it and you're trying to navigate that, there are amazing resources out there. You do not have to walk through this alone. So I'm excited to bring my friend Rosie on just to share a little bit more about pornography and the impact it's had on our world as well as what we can do to fight it. I have my really good friend, Rosie McKinney on the show. She's a fabulous Christian leader, as well as author um, with her book, Fight for Love. And I'm just so thankful that she's on the show with us today. But Rosie, can you tell us a little bit more about yourself and uh, let our viewers know who you are? Sure, first of all, it's so lovely to see you, Melissa. Melissa is one of my favorite people. So this is a joy um, to, to be chatting with you today. Um, so um, I am married to Mark. And I'm British. That's the funny accent. Um, I live in California and I've got um, two boys, eight and 10. And I'm the founder of Fight for Love Ministries. And we're sort of a community of women who equip other women with the faith and the facts to fight back about uh, pornography addiction in their relationship. So we have um, a weekly podcast. Sometimes it's a panel discussion. Sometimes we interview experts. Um, we also have a community group on Facebook and lots of other resources. Wonderful. So I want to kind of share with viewers about pornography addiction. A lot of people aren't really understanding how prevalent of an issue it is. And so I wanted to kind of understand, you know, how, how often is this happening? Um, how many people are really impacted by this? Yes. Great idea. Give us some context. Well, fortunately, a few years ago, um, Josh McDowell commissioned a Barna study. He spent $300,000 to do the biggest survey ever undertaken in the American church. So now we have the data, so we really do know. So he found out that 79% of guys who attend evangelical church are regularly looking at pornography. And uh, out of married men, he says 55%. So this is over half of marriages that are dealing with that. And I'd say that's probably conservative estimate. So over half of marriages which i did the math and that is uh well if we if we think about the divorces because um i think that's an important point to, to raise at this point as well the uh, american association of matrimonial divorce lawyers they said that 64 percent of divorces cite obsessive pornography use as a contributing factor so doing the math on that that works out to about 500,000 marriages directly related to 
compulsive pornography use. So if we think about the amount of people who are doing it, the amount of marriages that are affected by this, and then the repercussions, you know, coming out the back end, half a million divorces a year from pornography use, or at least a, a significant contributing factor, this is something that we have to talk about. And I'm really grateful that you're willing to use your platform to, to raise awareness about this. So, you know, obviously it can lead to divorce, but for those that are still in marriage, how does this affect the health of a marriage? Oh, great question. Well, I think the best way to think about this is to think about the impact of pornography on the brain and then the effect of the brain on the relationship, if you know what I mean. Mm -hmm. Because pornography makes users, people who are compulsively using it, it makes them dissatisfied with their partners. You know, they've done, there's so much research out there now. There is so much research, you know, religious and secular, you know, mainly secular data. You can't argue it that there's no ax to grind. So it makes them dissatisfied with their partner's attractiveness, sexual performance, decision-making. It makes them depressed because of the way that the brain responds to uh, these crazy chemicals that are produced in the brain. It actually produces, not only does it numb the pleasure response, which um, means that your drug, your, your um, pornography is no longer working, but it changes your baseline of happiness because um, the brain's never designed for the way that pornography affects the brain, which is producing this crazy high chemical experience. So the way that the brain responds is it produces a break-like chemical with a really long name, which is abbreviated to C-R-E-B. And I can't say any more than that. So there's this break-like chemical that's released. And what that does is that it sort of, um, it numbs our, our pleasure cycle for everything. So this is why users of pornography appear just lackluster with life, fed up with everything, no longer interested in things that used to interest them because their baseline of happiness has been lowered. So now they actually need a hit of their drug uh, you know, to, to access pornography to feel normal so it makes you dissatisfied it makes you depressed it distances you you've got this secret life going on it makes you detached and also it makes you dumb and i don't mean to be offensive but there are you know there have been studies you know well, it's documented evidence that um compulsive pornography use causes a condition called hypofrontality in the brain which is the same thing you get when you have a head-on collision so what it does, it impairs the functionality of your prefrontal cortex, your decision-making center. So you're no longer able to make rational decisions. So you've got a dissatisfied, depressed, detached, um, disassociated guy who is making dumb decisions. So even though he knows that this is greatly affecting his wife, um, this is you know, possibly threatening his job, you know, it's significantly impacting on his, on, on every area in his life. He's not making rational decisions anymore. He's not actually able to say, mm, maybe I shouldn't be doing this because um, his brain is not, it's not working anymore. It's been addled by the pornography. So your question, original question was, um, how does it affect relationships? Well, if you think, what is it like to live with a guy who is depressed, who is dissatisfied with you, who is making dumb decisions, who is um, detached from you, distant, you know, it's extremely painful and it's so confusing and it's so, it's so hurtful because it isn't just the betrayal. It's not just the fact that he's arousing himself to other people. It's the fact that he's lying about it. The foundation of your, your trust is, is completely ruined because you feel like if he's lying in this area, what other area is he lying in? He's no longer the person that you married. He's certainly not behaving like it. And now he's hiding things. It, it's so, it is crazy land. It is so confusing and so traumatizing. And what makes it worse is all the ways that we try and fix it. So we go, okay, so he's looking at pornography. It's got to be me. You know, I've, I've gone and talked to some people and they've said, well, Maybe you should spice things up. Maybe you should just watch it with him. You know, and we hear this again and again. And, and people don't understand that you're trying to compete with a chemical experience. It's never going to work. You can ne you're never going to compete with all those chemicals being released in his brain. Just like with a gambling addict, you wouldn't go, 
well, if I give you a suitcase of cash, will you stop? It's like, it's not about the cash. It's about the thrill. So pornography, it's about the thrill. It's not about the sex. So providing more marital sex isn't going to work. In fact, what it's going to do is A, give him the message that his behavior doesn't bother you because you're still willing to have sex and it doesn't bother you. And the other thing, it just destroys your heart. It just, because you're forcing yourself to do something when the, your instinct, or the Holy Spirit speaking to you is saying, no, something is wrong here. Something is deeply, deeply wrong with the intimacy in, in our marriage. And you just overriding your feelings, your gut instinct, and pushing down all those feelings of hurt and rejection is not gonna make it better. The idea is not to get over the pain of him using pornography. The idea is to get rid of the pornography. And that I think is an important mind shift for women because so often it's like, well, how do I cope with this? How do I cope with this? How do I forgive him and move past it? Or maybe I just need to compete with it. No, no, no. You just need to get rid of it. You need to do firm boundaries. I love it. I appreciate you just being able to be like an expert resource on this because I'm sure there's a lot of women listening to this show that they have experienced it in their own marriages and they feel stuck. They feel trapped. They don't know what to do. Um, so I appreciate you just sharing some of the background on, you know, this is a really prevalent issue. Um, so with that, I want to kind of hear a little bit about your story. How has this impacted you? Why have you become an expert in this field? Well, it was always my dream growing up. <laughs> no, no, it wasn't. Okay. So, um, the truth is I've been around this merry-go-round twice. So prior to becoming a Christian, prior to getting married, um, I had already been in a long-term relationship with an unrepentant porn addict. And I knew from that, by learning the hard way, that nothing works. N nothing can fix this. Nothing can control this. Nothing I did was gonna fix this. And he remained unrepentant, wasn't his issue, was my issue. And eventually that fell apart. So then I become a Christian, then I get married. And uh, I, I know that Mark has struggled with this in the past, but his attitude is, that was wrong. I don't want that in our life. So I'm like, it's not gonna be a problem. He's totally on board. You know, obviously everybody struggles. Uh, you know, we can get through this. This isn't gonna be a big problem because it's such a different scenario I've got. You know, from being with someone who doesn't want to admit that it's a problem to being with someone who does want to admit that it's a problem, you know, this is going to be golden. Unfortunately, forgetting that pornography isn't just a, you know, a theoretical sin. Like, I don't like the idea that he does it. It actually affects their behavior. You know, it can make them withdrawn or it can make them angry and critical and resentful. And so when I started to see the same signs again, both inside and outside the bedroom, the same red flags, I'm like, I've done this before. I'm not doing this again. And it wasn't like I'm so healthy. I'm so, uh, you know, my, my self-esteem is, is so good that I'm able to put these boundaries. It was literally sort of a PTSD reaction from the fact that I can't do this again. I cannot do this again. I know how this works again. So I just said enough. I love you too much <clears throat> to, to not tackle this issue. So either you get help or that's it. So that was my firm line in the sand. So inadvertently, I did exactly the right thing, which is drawing that firm line in the sand. But I did it accidentally. I didn't do it because I understood. I, did it, I didn't do it because I you know, had done all the research at that point, had spoken to hundreds of wives. I just did it out of desperation. Like, no, I can't go through this again. Um, so that, that was our story. So fortunately, my husband, Mark, he'd lost a previous marriage to this. He'd been battling this on his own for many, many years. He didn't want it, but he, he, he didn't know what to do. He, he hadn't, you know, he didn't know how to get out of it at that point. So he was then very willing to get into recovery and that's what we did. So, you know, we've had an interesting or an unusual marriage trajectory, because normally it starts pretty high, doesn't it, at the wedding, and then it sort of maybe comes down a bit. Ours sort of started like, and, and it just got better and better. But it's been a lot of hard work. So that's my story. But as, uh, as we got into recovery, we realized that community was the way forward. And so I started making community for wives because there wasn't anything where I was. There was some stuff for guys, but not for wives. And I just realized that this was an area that nobody talked about. 
and there was a desperate need for it and it gave me incredible friendships and incredible hope and and I just feel that you know this you know this is a path I have been put on to to help other women come out of the shadows and find and find the the, go- the pot of gold at the end of the rainbow it, it really is because this might not have been my dream but it is kind of turning into that because I'm so purposeful now and I get to literally pull women out of the swamp and give them hope and and a belief that it is possible a porn free marriage is possible you don't get your old husband back minus the pornography what you get is the husband that he was meant to be before he got hooked into this filth as a teenager you know he didn't ask for this any more than you asked for this um so i i i just my message is um yes stand up for yourself draw that firm line in the sand but the reason that we're fighting for love and that we're doing this proactive boundary setting, not enabling, not competing, not, you know, um, what's the word prematurely forgiving, not doing any of those things, the boundaries. The reason we're doing this is because we want to create the marriage that we were designed to have, which is a fully authentic, vulnerable, intimate marriage. And it's impossible to get that when pornography is present. So that's what you're fighting for as opposed to what you're just fighting against. I liked what you said about it being a swamp. And it's like this, you can feel isolated when you're in this experience. You can feel like you're isolated in the swamp, but knowing that there's so many other women that are in the same experience and resources like yours that have the potential to pull you up out of that. I think a lot of women are, again, they're still in that and they desperately need that freedom that comes from putting those boundaries up, getting help. Um, So I guess, you know, what would you say to the woman not only that, you know, maybe there's some women, I think that they are this, you know, their spouse, their husband is walking through this addiction. What would you also say to women that maybe they're walking through this as an addiction? I'd say you're not alone. This isn't your fault. There is hope and there are such tremendous resources now available to you and such incredible community that as soon as you can't, as soon as you start to come out of the shadows and take that brave step and just reach out to qualified people, people who know what it's all about, people who understand, people who get it, people who've been there, your life will be transformed. As soon as you grab hold of their hands and, and, and let them pull you out because you're drowning and I want you to give yourself grace because you're in a swamp. You, you can't get out on your own. And that's the message that, you know, well, the church really isn't talking to women at the moment. It should be, but it's not really. It just talks to guys and talks about being warriors and, you know, we're men of integrity and valor and, you know, stand up and fight for freedom. And I'm like, you're in a swamp. You're in a swamp. You need someone to pull you out. It doesn't matter how much of a warrior you're feeling. You can't get out. Your brain's not working correctly. Even as much as you want to, you get stressed, you get triggered. You're going to be back down in that swamp. You actually need someone to reach down and throw you a lifeline and many times they can't even do that many times you know women can't do that they actually need someone else to come alongside them and say hey what's going on you know or even just start the con- I, you know if I was doing women's ministry now I I just put the conversation on on a regular road you know let's talk about this every six months because statistically what is it a third of porn users are now women you know you're gonna have a significant proportion of women in your little group dealing with this and it's so hard to come forward. You can't wait for them to come forward. That they're, they're not gonna do it. There's so much extra shame associated with, you know, with porn addiction for women because the question that people asked is not how can we help women? It's like, why are they doing that? Like, what's wrong with them? Which is completely the wrong question to ask because women's brains are exactly the, the same level of susceptible as men's brain that, you know, they've plugged us in and our brains light up in exactly the same way. When we're shown pornography, we are just as susceptible. And remember, it's not what we're watching that we can't wait to do because it's our fantasy. No, it's the chemicals in our brain that are being produced. It's the thrill. So, um, but also for women, there is the, the, the added danger because of the way that we actually interact with the pornography. So when guys are watching pornography, they, they objectify what they're seeing. 
that's how they interact with it. But women actually project themselves into the action. So if you think about when you're watching it, you're conditioning your brain to be aroused by what you see. And the way that you're interacting is you're, you're, be, you're the one in pornography being abused, being degraded, humiliated. That is going to have significant effects, effect on your intimate life going forward when you actually need to get in the same headspace in order to feel aroused, in order to find pleasure in your marital relationship. So this is a topic that we desperately need to talk to women, which was not your question. Your question is, what do we say to people who are struggling? Just, you're not alone and there is so much hope and there are so many women now who are coming out the other side who are fighting really hard to, to give you the same freedom and the same truth because I think when you're in it, and I have not been addicted to pornography, I think I was born in the wrong generation, fortunately. Um, I, 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 from, but with what I've heard, you know, talking to my husband and other addicts is that you, you've tried, you've tried a hundred times to give up and it doesn't work. So you think, I just haven't got it in me. I just, there's some, there's something uniquely wrong with me that these other people can get out of it, but I can't. And I'm telling you, the key is fellowship. The key is fellowship. You cannot pull yourself out of the swamp on your own. doesn't matter how strong you are. You've got no arms at that point. You need somebody else. That would be my advice. Honestly, I love everything you said. I feel like you're speaking like right to me. I mean, I shared with my uh, viewers right before this interview that this is something that I've dealt with personally as a woman being addicted to it. And it's something that we don't talk about in the church. And it's something that it's been interesting as I've shared with close friends and people that I know that this is something I'm going through or I've gone through. It's crazy to me, like how many women are walking through the same stuff, but we don't talk about it. And it's like what you're saying, it's the stats show. It's, there's so many women that deal with this, but we just choose to isolate. Yeah. And obviously God doesn't want that for us. He doesn't want us to live in isolation. doesn't want us to live in bondage to this. And so- What, um, what, what would you say, Melissa? What would you say to somebody? Gosh, I mean, I would just say that it's not your, the rest of your life doesn't have to look like this. Mm -hmm. that there is possibility to find freedom. Cause I know when I was really struggling, I was like, this is just going to be my life forever. And, um, there's no way that I could ever get over this. It's just, this is just what life is now. And now that I'm on the other side of that, my marriage is better. Everything, things that come along with that are better. And man, I don't live with shame anymore. And, um, just to know that for other women to know, like that's possible. Like whether your spouse is the one going through it or you're the one going through it, like freedom is possible. Um, so I guess just to sum up, I would just love to hear some um, ways that women can heal from this. Like what are some resources that you provide, not just your book, but also your support group? I would love to hear a little bit more about how they can follow you and continue to be encouraged by you. So resources for um, spouses or girlfriends or partners who are dealing with this in their relationship. Well, here's one I prepared earlier, but literally that's what our ministry does. And we are, we are like the paramedics who go around and we pick you up when you're hurting and confused. And we say, Hey, this possibly could be the problem. And look, these are all the resources and avenues of healing open to you. So um, go and check out our website because we have a huge long resource page. And then I'm doing a series on my podcast, Fight for Love, um, where, we, where I interview sort of the leaders of lots of different other ministries so that you get a flavor of, or you, you, get to, you get to hear what the heart is of each of these ministry leaders and what is the flavor, what is the DNA of their group, because they're all slightly different. And, you know, maybe you're in a very abusive relationship. If so, this ministry is going to be perfect for you. Maybe you're you know, maybe something else. So this is going to be your, maybe your sort of, you know, you're not married yet. So maybe this is your research resource. Um, so yeah, we're, we're trying to do that job for you just to speed the process up because when you find your tribe, the people who get it, who are in the same situation as you, everything changes, everything changes. It's like you suddenly realize that this is real life and everything out there wasn't because you're finally able to share exactly what's been going on for you and that really does feel like you have slipped into another dimension where you can start being honest with what is really going on in your life and it's a 
beautiful thing. It is a beautiful thing, especially if you've been struggling with this for a really long time and feeling in the shadows and feeling ashamed and so confused for so long. To actually feel plugged in and connected to other people is, is amazing. It is, it's mind blowing. So uh, yeah, that would be my best bet. Instead of me like just listing off a whole bunch of resources, go and check out the resource page of our website, which is fightforloveministries.org. Right on. Um, and I, that's the thing that really has come back to, for me with every issue I've ever faced is we need to have community. And I love that you have provided that. I mean, the Facebook, it's a private Facebook group that you've got going on for women that are going through this. It's really powerful to see the camaraderie and women just coming together and supporting one another through this. Like what you're saying, it's when you feel isolated, when you feel like you're alone in this, and then all of a sudden to like be opened up to this, I'm not alone. Um, it's, it's life-changing. And I just, I love seeing what God is doing in and through you and your ministry to really bless these women that need the support. So, I mean, for my listeners, I'm, if this is something that you're walking through, I want you to know Rosie's got a really phenomenal, again, her book, podcast, this Facebook group, a lot of really amazing resources to help you to find hope in the middle of pornography addiction, whether it's your personal addiction or that of your spouse. So, um, Rosie, thank you again so much. I really appreciate you taking the time just to encourage us today and bring us some of the stats as well as just ways that we can find freedom from this. <laughs>